You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 68, The Business of Sleep with Michael Cohen. We've all heard how airway and sleep are changing dentistry as we know it. It can make or break the longevity of your dentistry or even save lives. It all sounds great until you think about the difficulty of making this a part of your everyday practice. Michael Cohen brings over 13 years of experience to the table as he explains the basics of how to implement this potentially intimidating area into your practice. How do you legally and effectively screen your patients? How do you create a team that can effectively help you manage your patients? Can you make more money on this stuff, or is it just for Jeff Rouse. It's all coming up this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call one 800 472 8302 today. That's 1 800 472 8302. And by Restorative Driven Implants. Understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment from John and Wes, the dental guys. Go to restorativedrivenimplants.com right now to sign up for the next series of courses and take your implant education to the next level. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. John, it's an exciting time here at the Voices of Dentistry. We've been doing a lot of things. And tell us a little bit about um, our sponsor. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about restorative-driven implants. So this is uh, a new continuum that uh, Wes and I have gotten involved with, uh, and we're pretty excited about it this year because this is our really our first year kicking this off full force. Uh, what is restorative driven implants? Well, it's an implant continuum where you will learn the basics through the advanced of implant surgery and restorative. Our goal at restorative driven implants is to provide a comprehensive educational experience that focuses on the best end result for the patient. That's why it's restoratively driven. We'll equip participants with the skills and tools they need for successful implant placement and seeding the final restoration. So this is a uh, continuum, which means it's multiple parts. It's going to be a three-part comprehensive placement education, as well as we're going to have training in prosthetics. You're going to have implementation. You're going to have dental assistants, training dental assistants on how to do the sterilization techniques and a septic technique. You're going to have lecture. You're going to have online component. 60 hours of CE, West. Super pumped about it. Yeah, and we're going to also be bringing uh, part of this as an implementation team components. So, you know, one of the things we find that's a problem a lot of times is people go learn how to place implants, but they have no idea how to talk to their patients about implants. And our uh, restorative driven implant continuum will include a day where you will actually get to understand how to bring this into your practice and get your team on board. With restorative driven implants, you will learn to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment. If you'd like to get involved with it, learn more about it, restorativedrivenimplants.com, restorativedrivenimplants.com. Or call 1-715-207-6587. And the stream is brought to you by live stream from the Voices of Dentistry by Kittenbach. Uh, Kittenbach, buy smart, buy direct. Hey, listen, uh, we want you to use quality materials, and Kittenbach is providing those. And we're happy to bring them on as a sponsor of the Voices of Dentistry. From everything from Panacil Tray Soft, which is their VPS material, to Identium, to... Um, uh, Visalis Core to, to really nice uh, uh, tent material. Uh, Kittenbox got it. And if you head over and call Eric Cortez at 1 877 532 2123, tell him the dental guy sent you and, and give us some love. It's because of Kittenbox that we can provide you this content this week uh, at the Voices of Dentistry and on the show. So I want to introduce uh, someone that, that I met out. 
in Raleigh, North Carolina at T-Bone's house, but I'd like to welcome to the show Michael Cohen uh, from Awaken to Sleep. And let me just kind of read this off here is that Michael is the founder and CEO <laughs> of Awaken to Sleep. It's an innovative home sleep testing company that combines the use of advanced technology and screening techniques to streamline the process of treating sleep apnea for dentists across the United States. And by utilizing his extensive knowledge of sleep medicine and over 13 years in the industry, Michael Cohen has uniquely positioned Awaken to Sleep to fulfill their vision of empowering providers to change their patients' lives one good night's sleep at a time. So, Michael, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Dental Guys. Thank you, Wes. So, tell us a little bit about how you got started in sleep uh, disordered breathing. Yeah, so uh, actually for me, it started as a job, to be honest with you. It was about 14 years ago now. I started off as a sleep tech working nights in a children's hospital and uh, really had no idea that uh, a couple of years after that process, that clinical knowledge would, uh, in fact, be a component of saving my daughter's life. Hmm. I've got a nine-year-old daughter who was uh, diagnosed at five months old with severe sleep apnea. And it was undiagnosed for the first five months of her life, even though she struggled with uh, severe reflux and apnea, we just had no idea. And it was the training as a tech that actually made a huge difference in my own family. And uh, she's here today. She's a... It's amazing. Tell us a little bit more about that, because that story itself is riveting. Mm. So, uh, yeah, we we brought her home from the hospital. She's born a healthy baby. Uh, Her lungs were fine. And... uh, she just uh, cried all the time, man. I mean, she was a sick kid. We didn't know what was going on. We had her in and out of the doctor's office. We knew that she had ear infections. We knew that she had re- reflux. But, uh, I mean, for a five-month-old, she had 13 bilateral ear infections by the time she was five months. Wow. Two of them perforated her left eardrum. It was, it was intense. And uh, it, was, it was crazy. Uh, she would scream all day long. All the pictures we had in those times were a uh, right. screaming kid. But I walked in on her uh, sleeping, taking a nap during the middle of the day, and come to watch her. She's laying on her back and wasn't breathing. Mm. And I watched her lift up her hands and gasp for air, and her fingertips were blue and her lips were blue. Man. It was nuts. And uh, in that moment, it really triggered for me what I had been trained as a wow. sleep tech and had witnessed other people's kids doing that in a clinical environment. Wow. So... Uh, yeah, we called the hospital. We tried to get her in for a, a STAT sleep study that was going to take months to get in for. And uh, that wasn't going to work for us because she might not be around for months. And uh, we were able to call in a favor from a friend that worked at the pediatric sleep center, borrowed some equipment. I assisted another tech who only knew how to test adults uh, in a different center. And the rest is history, man. The doctors got on treating her reflux disease and... It was powerful for us. Reflux for her as an infant was the cause of her sleep apnea. Hmm. Whereas for adults, apnea is usually what causes their reflux. So 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 they could reverse 180. Absolutely. So, yeah, that was that was as a family. I mean, that was our lightning rod. That was what made sleep apnea passionate for me instead of just a job like anything else. So what was your pathway from that to what you do now? Just to kind of give us a summary of that. Yeah, so uh, from that point, uh, I worked with a large national company, built sleep centers across the country. Uh, Then it shifted to uh, doing treatment. So I was working with CPAP companies and dealing with intolerant patients. Uh, A lot of people that, you know, need CPAP can't wear it. And about seven years ago, I started working in dental. actually started uh, pioneering, working with dentists, helping them implement sleep apnea in their practice overcoming a lot of the hurdles and stuff that they deal with from a business standpoint, a clinical standpoint, that type of thing. Hmm. So that's, that's been the part, the path. So, you know, one of the things I want to get right into kind of the meat of, of the show about, um, implementation, because I know that's a big part of what your company does. And, you know, we, we hear a lot of discussion about, uh, sleep disordered breathing as far as the clinical aspects. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of people talking, including today about, you know, how to diagnose, or I guess maybe not diagnose is the word we should use, but how to screen, how to discuss uh, uh, treatment options, and uh, how to start thinking about appliance therapy. Um, But 
there seems to be a lot of barriers. They're the most barriers for implementation and really from the business side of things. Um, so tell us a little bit about how your company helps uh, offices go from the knowledge uh, of what is sleep disorder breathing, how does it work, to the implementation. Yeah. Uh, so we basically we want to be problem solvers for folks. Um, as a dentist, you've got a lot of education on the dental clinical side of the house. This is a medical condition. Like you mentioned, there's a lot of great clinical CEs out there uh, that you can go attend as the doctor, some you can even bring your team to. But being able to implement it on a team level is critical. So from our company standpoint, we specialize in on-site training. So we send a trainer out to actually help the team get involved with apnea, start developing their why, and really optimize from a workflow standpoint, how do we do this? You can learn about it all day long at a bazillion courses and they're phenomenal they've got great intel but if you can't deliver that care to your patients it still hasn't quite helped so we're hopefully that last operational business aspect of the implementation from billing and quoting patient fees all the way to billing medical insurance etc Um, Additionally, we also have uh, home sleep testing solutions. So one of the other hurdles once you start implementing this is getting a diagnosis. Like you just mentioned, you can screen, but you can't diagnose uh, as a dentist. It's outside of your scope. But what we offer is a suite of solutions where we can ship home tests to your patients. You can own a home sleep test and use our interpretation service where our doctors that are licensed in your state are gonna interpret that data, give you the diagnosis, and then the prescription for recommended treatment. Hmm. So basically, if if, uh, an office wants to to do this, you can can come in, what type of training do they need to have before calling you? I mean, so so how much um, clinical knowledge, uh, how how do you, I guess if you're a dentist who maybe doesn't have any training, say, mm-hmm. in sleep disorder breathing, but you're, you're kind of thinking, man, this sounds interesting to me. I'd really like to get involved with this. I have friends that are doing it. Uh, or maybe I have a person in my life who has been affected by it and I want to treat it. Where do you guys come in? At what point do you come in? Do you come in right from the beginning and teach the basics of that and, and a lot of the clinical decision making? Or is that something where you'd say, go take some CE from these people and then call me when you're kind of ready to go to the next step. Yeah, I don't think there's a perfect formula for that. I really think it's doctor specific. Uh, There are some clients of ours that are on-site one day, eight hour training, half of which is clinical, half is focused on operations. Some doctors are gonna start working with their patients and getting them tested and moving forward in the process just from that. Uh, Most clients that we deal with, have the doctors have already been to some CE. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's rare to find, for me, to find a, a new client that has never heard of sleep apnea. It's, it, it's extremely rare. But they definitely haven't taken their team to those CE courses. Yeah. So that's much more common. So it may be the doctor has CE or, you know, education on the topic, but their team may have no education on it at all. So we can work with practices from the ground up or we can come in and optimize the workflow that they've already started working with and have hit some hurdles. It really is practice specific. Okay, okay. So I think that's uh, the thing that that makes, you know, sleep difficult to implement is being, one, it's, it's medicine. And medicine is definitely different than dentistry. And there are some, there's a lot of barriers when it comes to communicating with medical insurance, with really even physicians, uh, they, they're just, it's just a different whole mindset. It's Jeff Rouse talked about on a, on a previous show, it's interdisciplinary. It's no longer a multidisciplinary. It's a cross medicine and dentistry thing. And that's hard. And as he said, he said that dentists, general dentists need to lead the way. Absolutely. And and tell us why general dentists need to lead the way. Yeah, general dentists need to lead the way because they're inside the patient's mouth every single day. I mean, apnea happens in the posterior hypopharynx, which is the back of the throat. Right. So if you're looking at that area all day long, every hygiene patient, every restorative case, you have 
dozens and dozens of people, sometimes on a daily basis, that have never been spoken to about apnea from a medical colleague, but you're looking at their airway and have at least a half a dozen to a dozen signs that you can look at in their mouth that would be predictive of airway issues. Right. So your job would then, as an implementer, which is the hardest thing to do, like John, you and I have talked about this, turning a ship, you know, to go and add an exam component to add something else, you know, is a, it's a disturbance in your practice. I mean, it really is. And this, this is probably... Um, probably been the biggest disturbance in my treatment planning process that I've ever done um, from a standpoint of like the workflow of the exam like you know when we came back from spear education after we got our initial sleep training you and I talked about the forms and and all the stuff that we got and it's like how do we even like put that in play Mm -hmm. and in your practice where it's two doctors Mm -hmm. yourself and and your associate and then four hygienists, hygienist, and then how and he many, doesn't have and he doesn't have the training right. my associate at this point right you know, on the sleep yeah. turning your ship is a lot harder than turning my ship because mm-hmm. I'm a sole practitioner with two hygienists two or three assistants and so you know you might go into an office like what you're saying is that has zero training on one side but then a lot of training from John's perspective But then to me, I think where you come in play is because you've had so much experience in sleep business, meaning working with physicians. So speak to that because you've given me some insight um, on the communication because um, with physician because and and talk to why because John and I are all all about this. We're not about tell us one first why we should involve a physician. Okay, because that's a danger zone if you don't. Okay, and talk, speak to that. Number two, John and I are concerned about that. We don't want to be doing things that are out of the scope of practice. Yep. So, speak to what you're doing and teaching us how to communicate and get the physician and how to find and give us a few pearls. Yeah, tell us a little bit about what a good a, a good fit for a general dentist practice as far as a physician that would be willing to work with you. Sure, absolutely. So. On the first question, uh, where do you involve a physician and where do you make sure that you're sitting well within your scope of practice versus outside, where, which is a danger zone? Um, I think clearly the ADA has just come out with their statement on mm-hmm. what the overall scope of practice should be. Right. And then it's the state licensure that can limit that as well. If right, because there's to. some states that t- say we can't do certain things. Correct. So the general assumption and understanding based on the ADA statement is that the general dentist should be the primary screening component, right? So you're the first identifier of apnea patients, if you will. You're the referral source. Now you can own your own home sleep testing equipment, as you do. You could refer home sleep tests to another provider like us. Um, But the main point of all that regardless of how you implement testing, or like Jameson Spencer mentioned earlier, referring out to a sleep physician in a sleep center. The main component there is that you're having that sleep physician diagnose sleep apnea if it's present and recommend treatment. So that's the main component that you have to have, no matter how you want to do it testing-wise. The patient has to take an objective test. They have to be have those results interpreted by a boarded sleep physician licensed in your state. Now, there's some concern about... HSTs being administered by dentists. You know, mm-hmm. American Academy of Sleep Medicine has come out strongly against that. Right. Um, where do you see that taking us as far as litigation, as far as, you know, Board of Medicine complaints? Um, there's some concern, as we were talking about with Dr. Spencer earlier about that. Um, should we be worried about that? Should we be, or should we just forge ahead knowing that the ADA is behind us? Yeah. I think that's a really good question. Uh, speaking as a non-attorney, let's clarify that. Yeah, of Since course. we're talking about potential legal outcomes in the future, I think the, the two most paramount things that we have to understand is we're talking about two different things when we talk about clinical guidelines and legal versus payer guidelines, okay? So if we're dealing with clinical and legal guidelines, you have to follow your state board, period, end of story. If they don't have a specific 
scope of practice that's defined for obstructive sleep apnea in your state, then you follow the ADA. It's their job to define what your scope of practice is. And the ADA has done that. And if the state that you're operating in hasn't, then ultimately you would be under the jurisdiction of the ADA statement. So as long as you're following those legal guidelines that you're supposed to be subjected to, I, I can't imagine that you would have any type of legal ramification. Why do you think that the ASM has come out against that? We are on the air, right? We are. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so the, candidly, uh, the American <laughs> Academy of Sleep Medicine has done a fantastic job of going from being a rogue board in 2011, becoming an actual American Board of Medical Specialties recognized board and educating sleep physicians. So any physician, internal medicine, cardiologist, ENT, they're the ones that are responsible for educating and mandating the criteria to become a sleep physician. That being said, if, as Wes mentioned earlier, I'm, uh, my expertise, if you will, is on the business side of sleep. There's a significant business component to being mm -hmm. a sleep physician. It's extremely difficult for these guys, any of them, regardless of how skilled they are or new they are, to have a full-time sleep practice that just receives sleep referrals and doesn't do anything else. If you don't have a pulmonary practice that you've added sleep into or a internal medicine practice that you've added sleep medicine as a component, it would be very difficult to not have all of the consults and the sleep lab test. It takes a sleep physician to run a sleep center. So there's a business component of kind of protecting what is their own, if you will. And I'll, I'll have to say, to give them credit, they've been under fire from insurance guidelines mm. for quite some mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. uh, in most medical PPO insurance companies will require a home sleep test prior to even authorizing a polysomnogram, an in-lab test, because it's more inexpensive for them. Sure. Now, I'll give you my personal two cents on that topic. It's not legal, it's not financial. I'm a patient advocate. Mm. My daughter, my family was directly affected by this. There are 85%, millions and millions of people in America that have no idea that they have sleep apnea. We don't have enough sleep center beds to house those people. In fact, the Department of Transportation, just with President Trump, threw out a bill that's been pending for almost seven years on the regulatory impact on the DOT um, transportation industry, hmm. forcing drivers to go get sleep tests. Hmm. They threw it out because the access to care and the workflow to get those people tested yeah. wasn't there. It'd be too much money and too much time. Correct. Yeah. So I'm a huge fan of opening the funnel. Anyone that can have a clinical conversation with a patient, get them tested objectively and fit the criteria of bringing in that boarded sleep physician whose knowledge is critical in this process. Mm -hmm. We've got to in open up the funnel, access to care, but also follow the criteria that's set before us. Mm -hmm. I don't think that requires a sleep physician consult or necessarily an in-lab test unless there's neurological components to it. Yeah, and I'll just a kind of quick follow-up to that. It's, it seems like that's one of the biggest concerns that a lot of dentists have as they get more in toward this implementation question is, well, you know, am I, am I practicing within my scope? It seems like that's question number one that comes up. But what are other, and I, and I know you're not an attorney, you're not speaking, as, but what other, what other legal concerns should dentists have? I mean, are there things that we need to be watching out for? Is that the main one, is just making sure that we're following with the guidelines from the scope of practice? Are there other uh, issues we can get in trouble with? Or is it more of just, you know, if we're a patient advocate, if we're following what the guidelines are from the ADA and the state board, we're probably going to be okay? I mean, because I've heard about things such as, you know, liability if a patient, you know, say, I'll give you just a crazy hypothetical, but maybe not so crazy, make an appliance for a patient, patient doesn't have a follow-up polysomnogram, Mm -hmm. Oh man, patient dies. Bad news. Bad news. Right now, yeah. that's that's a crazy example, maybe. Sure. But how does that interface with us as far as dental liability? I mean, if the sleep physician diagnoses the patient, mm -hmm. and we're providing the treatment, that's it's a little scary yeah. when you start getting into that. So, how do you address concerns like that for somebody who's maybe trying to figure out? 
how to how to safely make sure that they're protected. Right. I think that's an awesome question. Um, and with frankly a really simple answer, uh, it's no different than doing implants freehand with very little clinical education and no documentation. <laughs> right. The second that you start doing anything new you have to make sure that your systems are in place. Hmm. So you as the clinician are educated. Your team is up to speed on all of the tools and the workflow. So what you just mentioned, that crazy hypothetical, is a non-issue, complete non-issue legally, if you have that patient's documented refusal in your chart for that follow-up test, or if they were not in their ideal position for their appliance. If hmm. you're in the titration period where you're you're every three weeks adjusting that person, you haven't reached an ideal setting to even test them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in those two circumstances, you would be completely covered medical legal. So here's, right. here's the right. thing that I think what you've just, you've just made our listeners think. John's question one, number two, is you just talked about a system that's very complex. You talked about titration every three weeks. You talked about, you just rattled off some things, documentation. We didn't even go into that. Yep. See, was because here's the thing is that I was working on walking before I ran, and I'm still not running with this. And, and my ship is smaller than John's, and I'm in a different location, a different area, and so I'm, I'm spearheading this a little bit differently than he is. Mm -hmm. And one... You get the science, you get the clinical exam down, you get the techniques down, but you just have to make sure that you are doing this right because people die from sleep disordered breathing. That's right. And when you came into my office and I hired you to come in, this is the reason. Because I don't want to be doing this and it be done wrong. Right. Yes, I can do this clinically. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that your soap notes, your referral letters, your documentation, the, the titration part of this, the protocols, the systems to put in place to actually do this, yep. it's very complex. Yep. You can't, I don't want people that are listening to this show to get the wrong feeling and message from our previous shows that everybody needs to be treating sleep apnea because I right. think we, we talk about that a lot. Like, you guys, it's changed our practice. Right. No doubt. It was in our practice changer right. you know, show. What we don't want you to do is to go out there, take a weekend course, mm -hmm. and immediately go back and try to change your practice and implement this. Because, John, we just started getting into this. And we're six, nine months into it, and you and I are just now starting to figure things out. And it takes money and time. Yep. And people like you that have a, a reason, a facet to come in, because there is documentation. Mm -hmm. There is follow-up. There, It's not easy. Okay? Yeah. It's not. This is the hardest thing that I've ever implemented. It, it requires a full-time employee, in my opinion, just to manage the the health insurance portion of this and 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 to champion the whole thing you know yeah. so i mean i've kind of rattled off a lot there John. yeah i mean that, that i think that's a question that i had was does it require a full-time employee mm -hmm. to do everything that's necessary if assuming the doctor is i'm going to say it does as, assuming the doctor is busy mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know in their practice elsewhere you can't do this without it uh, I'm just saying it. Now, Michael might have a different opinion. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd like to know maybe if you feel like, uh, and, I, and I'm sure there are practices that since you've worked with, with many different people, they're doing it multiple different ways. Yep. And I would like to know maybe what well, how many people what the gam with what Michael? the yeah what the gamut is <laughs> thousands and then, and then maybe what the most common thing is that you would recommend if somebody comes to you and says, okay, Michael, what what is it gonna take? Mm -hmm. um, I don't mean so much money. But, mm -hmm. like, what is it going to take as far as uh, people yeah. uh, in order to make this really work well in a, in a dental practice? Yeah, so I don't want to be ambiguous, but there are different types of practices, right? Sure. There right. are doctor evangelist practices where everyone is supporting the doctor. The doctor does all of the treatment planning. He talks fees. He discusses clinical. Very hands-on. And he is very happily the bottleneck. Yeah. In that type of a practice, you don't need an additional employee. You don't need to do what Wes is trying to do. 
I think the bottom line is in that kind of a practice, you that did tell doctor, me that. I forgot you told me that. Yeah, that, that doctor needs to be educated to the max. And he's going to do, frankly, in my humble opinion, he's going to do jobs that are way below his skill set mm -hmm. and his hourly rate. Um, in my opinion, sleep apnea is one of the most profitable, if not the most profitable aspect of the dental business when it's done as a team-driven source of revenue. Mm. So what Wes mentioned about having a full-time person in the practice doing sleep, I call that the sleep champion. Mm -hmm. It's a common terminology that's used in our industry. That person is really taking the load off of the doctor right. because their time is less expensive to the practice. They are clinically and administratively very well suited for that role. So you're, you're often recommending that someone have that person Absolutely. As, as a part of the team. It's, Absolutely. Would you say it's, it's a high percentage of practices that that is the way that they successfully, and I guess that's the main thing, is <laughs> successfully implement? Because I'm sure yes. that you work with offices where you do training and they don't implement because yep. they realize it's tough. I mean, is that true? Do you Absolutely. have it happen sometimes? Often. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I think the, the number one most critical component to success is team buy-in. Hmm. Um, hygiene, in, in the general practice, hygiene is the lifeblood of screening for all things restorative. Mm -hmm. Sleep apnea is no different. Instead of restoring a tooth, you're restoring an airway. But it's gonna be the same screening process. Yeah. The difference is instead of handing that patient off to the doctor who then has to go into why you're talking about apnea and having a form filled out and all those types of things, you can have a sleep champion do that and then because the they can refer them to the physician at that point, right? Yeah, you, you could can... refer them to the physician in an outside center. That person, if you decided to implement home sleep testing and have your own units, could dispense a device and then have that data read by the boarded sleep doctor. I mean, there's so many facets to this complex system that Wes mentioned that really doesn't require the doctor's time. Yeah. The most successful practices that I work with the doctors are spending 15 to 30 minutes per case, the entire case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's significant. I mean, most offices that are successful with this, the doctor doesn't spend a lot of time with that patient. The sleep champion does. The doctor has very important key roles in that sure. process that are only doctor yeah, roles. Like head and neck exam, those type things. Right. Appliance modification from a standpoint of vertical dimension. Things like that, you know? Yep. Um, delivery, so, so here's the pearl, delivery of the oral appliance. For medical insurance, you cannot bill until you deliver the appliance. The doctor has to be the one delivering the appliance. And I wonder how much is not being done correctly. And that's my concern is that I think we sell this as something easy. Mm -hmm. We sell it as something that could make you money that we have to really take a step back and really evaluate the full impact that um, incorporating this into your practice could take. You know, it's it's very, it's not, it's different than dental implants. It's different than doing your own, you know, root canals. It's it's different. And there's because it's it's multifaceted. So one of those things is that, that team component. We've already said we can't eliminate the physicians. We don't want to. That's not, not our all. goal. Yep. And and we have to have providers that are on the same page. What is your favorite, most ideal provider that's a medical doctor? Internal medicine. Okay. Yeah. Tell us why about that. Yeah, internal medicine physicians uh, primarily deal with adult patients. They're going to have an overall understanding of how all of the patient's systems work together in their body. And those guys, frankly, have a core Again, talking about the business of this, uh, the, the business aspect of their practice, they have a core problem with apnea. One, it's unidentified. Two, their normally taught recommended form of diagnosing and treatment has a very high cost to the patient. Getting them to go sleep in somebody else's bed, watched by a technician all night with a bunch of wires on their face. Most people that don't think they have apnea won't go to something like that. And the other additional problem that they have is they're trying to manage the patient's obesity, they're trying to manage their type 2 diabetes, their hypertension, all the cardiac diseases before that person gets referred to a cardiologist 
and they lose patients that way. Mm -hmm. So an internal medicine doctor, very similar to the general dentist, is uniquely positioned to manage patients from an identification standpoint, get them referred through the process, and also represent kind of a, the medical colleague partner to a general dentist. I like that to manage all of the medical conditions associated with apnea that are outside of your scope. We just talked to my sleep champion on the phone today, and she's been working. We've been trying to establish our medical colleague partner. I like that. And we, we may have found somebody that is interested in working with us. And it's not an internal medicine specialist, but it's somebody that after Jenny sat down and said, hey, we're not looking to do this on our own. We need a partner. Right. We need a, we need a person that can read our studies, that can understand what we're doing, that understands the benefit of OAT. Right. Um, and this person, she checked all the boxes for him, and she got a pass on to the practice manager and said, hey, we need to start a referral chain here. Yeah. And, and that communication that you taught her and taught me is invaluable. So, now, now, here's, here's, my, here's my, my real maybe tougher question, because the resistance that I'm hearing from physicians the most resistance um, is when they find out what it can cost patients. Yeah, okay? this is, you, this uh, is perfect because they, that's exactly what they saw today. Yep. It, they are, they freak yeah. because if you're not an in-network provider uh, for medical insurance, and that's a whole other podcast, which we won't go into today, <laughs> but if let's just assume for the sake of just the discussion today that you're not an in-network provider for medical insurance that oftentimes the, the cost for the oral appliance um, is, is more than what the physicians uh, expected. Absolutely. And it's more than what the patient sometimes expected. Mm -hmm. And the physician now can be kind of in a, in a bind where the patient comes back and says, well, you sent me to that, to that guy, and he's going to charge me this amount for this thing. Right. And the physician is kind of like, well, why aren't you in network with medical where it would be much less expensive or da da da? How do you address that concern? Or is it? I mean, it, it seems like that's a major concern. That's just in my little neck of the woods. But is that a major concern? And how do you address that? Yeah. Happened today, man. Yeah, it did happen today. Is Knoxville considered backwoods? No. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So not just in your neck. Of okay. The woods, John. Man. Yeah, it's oh. not just you. All right. It happened um, today, dude. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It actually did happen today. Okay, cool. Yeah. So um, there, there's a couple of components to that. So uh, kind of from the top down of what you mentioned, uh, sticker shock to the patient, sticker shock to the doctor, and then pressure from the doctor, the outside physician saying, why would you charge this much? Right. Um, so there's, my answer is kind of twofold. The first thing is you have to know your stuff before you start to go outside and try to work with some other physician because this gentleman or lady knows what they know and they know it well they may not know apnea well most internal medicine family practice type of physicians are managing hundreds of diseases most of them are chronic conditions that they see every day and apnea is severely underdiagnosed when we only have 15 percent identified this is not something they're normally dealing with mm -hmm. on a regular basis mm -hmm. or the volume that they could be so i think it's important that as the dental provider you do have internal systems and solutions built to where you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So you can have that confident conversation. Let's not talk, because like you said, medical insurance, in versus out of network, different podcasts. Right. Let's just say a cash fee, round number, 2,500 bucks. That's an oral appliance, all of the titrations and adjustments, et cetera, right? If you charge $2,500 for a piece of plastic, you're overcharging a patient. You probably never charge $2,500 for a night guard, right? Mm. But we know that moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea takes seven to 10 years off the end of somebody's life. You've already tried CPAP. You're a young guy. You want to be fit. You want to stay healthy. We also know that apnea is a progressive disease. It only gets worse with age and weight, right? So if at this point in your life, you can't use, in the physician's perspective, your gold, tre gold standard of treatment of CPAP, the next step is an oral appliance. We're going to treat you, adjust this, put a custom fit mouthpiece that is only gonna fit you, make sure it fits and is adjusted to your ideal setting, and we're gonna follow you and warranty this for two years. If that, and, and by the way, by treating that disease, 
It's adding years to your life and benefit and energy to your daily life right now. If that doesn't make sense to you, then I don't know why we're having that conversation. I, I personally, I would say that that may be the wrong physician to work with. Because if it's just dollars and cents, we're not really taking into account the patient's life and how much that matters. I mean, I got four little kids, 12, 9, 7, and 4. I want to see them graduate high school, college, have their own kids. Mm -hmm. If you take how much is my life worth, it's worth 2500 bucks. So I Jeff know Rouse said this today when it comes to orthopedic surgery, tens of thousands of dollars out of pocket because sometimes it doesn't get approved. Is that worth your life? Right. Yeah. I mean, and we're just, talking about like, and physicians look at that and they're like, what? Right. You know, I think that right. I think that the barrier is more just because I, I expected you to answer it that way. And I, and I appreciate that answer because it's the same answer that we give for anything we do in dentistry because we're we're, we're used to elective treatment mm -hmm. based upon patient needs sometimes, but also wants and how it makes them feel right. and and uh, trying to make them you know, more comfortable. So we're used to having those types of discussions in dentistry. I think that prob part of the problem may be that physicians, because of the way insurance dominates their world, mm -hmm. that they're, they're not used to having that discussion with people. I think they yeah. very yeah. rarely are saying, you know, hey, you need to spend money. That's important here, to spend money. That's not, I don't think that's a part of their normal day. Um, most physicians are just like, we'll send you up to somebody at the front, they'll figure out all the insurance so you don't have to spend money on anything. Right. It seems like it's just a difference in the way that we practice different areas of right. healthcare. care. I mean, I'd say, but, but I feel like it's a major barrier for some sure. even good physicians because their physicians don't want their patients to have to spend money on things right. if they can spend less money on things. Yeah, and I think uh, to couple it with what Jenny just dealt with today, the physician's comment was CPAP is 800 bucks. So why do you charge so much more for a mouthpiece that doesn't have moving parts or require electricity? Well, we're not really having an apples to apples conversation with that. Your CPAP machine itself, usually without the humidifier, is gonna cost you 800 bucks. If you add in the humidifier, it'll cost you another 100 to $200. And then you're gonna pay for supplies, whether you use them or not. If you're using, quote, using your CPAP and compliant, according to the definition, they're gonna ship you supplies every 90 days that you have a copay on for the rest of your life. So $800 really isn't the dollar amount. Mm -hmm. I know from my years of experience <clears throat> at a, working at a CPAP company, we made more year over year on patient supplies than we ever made on CPAP machines. Mm -hmm. The machine is your highest cost center, the supplies are not. So if we have an apples to apples conversation, we really need to understand how long is your oral appliance going to work? Two years, three years, five years? And it's that one fee, one time, for that many years of warranty and adjustments. I mean, frankly, I think that's a great deal. But you just have to find somebody who agrees Yeah. that that's a good deal. And they see the value proposition yeah. for the patient. And when, honestly, John, when you can articulate that in your own words as the clinician mm -hmm. or your Jenny, if you will, your sleep champion, can articulate that to the doctor, it's not putting them in their place, it's giving them another perspective. Sure. So when you're confident in the treatment that you offer and the lives that you're changing with patients, you can say that. And I think that's why she broke through today. She probably came through, we weren't there, you know, but she probably broke through today and she got the pass. Yeah. She got the pass. She got the pass. Now that's not, I mean, that's tough to train one, and number two, like you gotta find the right person to do that. I've got, got time to run around and try to do this. It's hard. Nor should you, Wes. Right. Your time is expensive. It's, it's right. You're more expensive than an outside so, sales rep. <laughs> so Michael, does your company also train for medical billing or do you typically have people that are outsourcing that? Uh, we do train for medical billing. So that way anybody who takes our training course can either bill on their own or they can work with a third party. Okay. Uh, I am a very firm advocate that when you're starting out, you need to follow the path of least resistance with the best clinical outcomes. I think that hiring a third party company is the wisest thing you can do when you have no idea about medical insurance. 
because we talked about your clinical workflow and how complex that can be and all the guidelines that you have to meet. In addition to that, you have an insurance overlay on that workflow with additional tasks of who does what and when that's a different process from your actual workflow. Mm -hmm. So I think that outsourcing that is a fantastic idea in the beginning. And then at that, at a later point when your production and the percentage you're paying that company exceeds what you'd pay a full-time employee, hire an expert gotcha. and put them in a seat. It's just, I mean, at that point, it's the business of dentistry. You're, you're doing things that make good business sense. It's yeah. Good. It's good. So I think the last thing we'd like to hear is a little bit about your company and what, I mean, I hired you to come in. That's why I wanted to have you on the show. One is because we had a great experience and really for us, we had just a few things that we were missing. And I was, I told you before Christmas, I said, you know, I've only done a, f delivered a few appliances and there was a couple things that I was off on and you were like, dude, <laughs> stop, you know, you were like, stop, you know, and, and it was good. And I appreciate that because I need an advocate, you know, yeah. I want to do it right, you know, and, and, and you were like, let you really, you kind of got my goals and you're like, let me come in. And you came in and you did an amazing job and, and Thank just you. helping us connect those bolts that first week, um, we, with the proper protocols that were already in place for these patients, you know, we, we went ahead and went forward with like six oral appliances with patients, which was amazing. It's amazing. And I texted you that and I said, you know, thank you because it was just getting it in line because I didn't want to be doing this and doing it wrong. Right. You know, and, and then for me too, it was the help with the sleep champion and getting that person on board into that position. Tell us a little bit about the services your company and the inclusion of our show and how people can find you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so we offer really two main components to what we do. Uh, the first is our home sleep testing set of solutions. So you can purchase devices from us, use us for interps on existing devices you have, or we can ship devices to your patients. So anything related to home sleep testing uh, we can work with a dentist, despite, you know, whatever their desired protocol is. Uh, the second thing is we offer that in-office training, and it is customizable. I mean, we have, John, to your question earlier, how much education does somebody have to have? We have a beginner course that's going to teach everybody that's never heard the words obstructive sleep apnea. So we can get them up to speed and operating with the workflow that's delivered, assigning roles, going through verbiage, et cetera. We can also, Wes, like with a practice like yours, take somebody that is already kind of crawling, starting to walk, and take it to the next level. Because your kinks were definitely evident to me, mm -hmm. but this is my world. That's right. I mean, you, you could have operated with doing a few patients here and there. But I felt like the medically legal part of that was I, was, I would be out of, out of sync. Yeah. You know? And I don't want anything bad to happen. Yep. So... So I think my, my two cents is uh, everybody in a general dentistry practice should be capable of identifying sleep apnea as the father to a daughter who almost passed from having That's sleep great. apnea. That's great. That's really the summation of all. Yeah. Yeah. That's what John and I really want to talk about, you know, right. and, and why we brought sleep up as a practice changer. Yeah. Yep. Is really, you know what it is about? Just being able to identify it. Yeah. Because yeah. if you can identify it, then yeah. great. Then however, however it ends up being treated is not as important as just that it's being treated and it's being right. identified. Right. So how, it, how can people get in touch with your company? Give us kind of your contact information. Where do people go to find out more? Yeah, so uh, you can Google us. Uh, our website is awaken to sleep That's the number two. awaken uh, to sleepcom <laughs> Peace. Yep. <laughs> Got to appeal to the millennials yeah. out there, right? That's yep. right. <laughs> um, you can reach me directly, Michael, at awakentosleep.com, uh, or you can call our office, 866-631-2232. Well, thank you for being on the show, yeah. and um, it's been a good one. And so for, um, for Wes, the dental guy, and John, the dental guy, and Michael, the sleep guy, the sleep guy, <laughs> the sleep guy. Nice. Uh, this has been a great show, and tune in more, and if... Uh, Hey, if you like this show, uh, send us a shout out on Facebook, Messenger. If you want to get in touch uh, with us, uh, hit us up on the Twitter as well. And uh, look for more shows just like this. And uh, again, for Wes, John, and Michael, we are the Dental Guys.